Hi, my name is David Peters and I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today about health system strengthening. I'm here in Baltimore and not in London, but Jerry Bloom had asked that if I could record a few words about uh, Future Health Systems Research Consortium and what we've learned about health system strengthening. And I think one of the, to begin with, I think one of the first lessons is that we're really beyond the stage of just simply selecting cost-effective interventions for strengthening health system or even beyond just trying to fund the building blocks, mostly the inputs of what goes into a health system. One of the things that we discovered through our research and others is that you know, even the most simple type of intervention is actually involves complex social interactions and so that you know, if you're trying to strengthen health system you need to be cognizant of the uh, complex nature of the health system. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, following. Uh, the other part is that if you're interested in reaching the poor or disadvantaged populations, this takes particular effort. In, in, in particular, it requires you know, stating the intentions of what you're trying to do, engaging vulnerable populations, uh, using data for disclosure and, and problem solving, particularly around issues of disadvantaged populations. It's also important in how you intervene, and it's not just uh, what you do, and, but, it, but how you do it in a way that addresses issues of uh, sustainability. So one of the things we looked at is the uh, developed a stork dilemma in a health system, and particularly looking at health market systems, looking at the different variety of players that might provide the core services, and a set of information and rules as well as support functions, support functions being your, uh, basically your building blocks. Uh, in addition to uh, that, you're looking at outcomes in terms of your health outcomes and whether you have a sustainable and growing market with a diversity of players and appropriate cost base and trying to avoid the distortions of many projects that are short term that uh, raise dependence and, and bloated cost base that basically die when the project is over. And so the develop distort dilemma approach looks at these issues and then tries to look at its core function and says who's going to do them, who's going to pay for them, who's going to provide and pay for the rules that needed around, uh, around directing the kind of, of services as well as those support functions and looking at who's paying for it now and who will pay for it when the project is over as well as who will do it now under a project and, and later. So it's really a frame or mindset really of around looking at, at how, what you're doing, the long-term consequences of, of any intervention in a health system. The other aspect that's important is that it's, it's not just enough to say what to do, but you really need to focus on implementation. And from previous work we've done on future health systems, and, and as well, again, from systematic reviews in, in the area, found that many interventions do work in strengthening health system. But there isn't really a single blueprint or magic bullet for how to do it. But rather, there are some universal processes and principles that can be followed. One of them is that a learning and doing approach really underlies a lot of the successful implementation strategies, no matter what the kind of policy or program intervention. And the other aspect is that you, know, you really need flexibility in management, use of data involving key stakeholders, um, and really to be able to provide implementation support uh, to address changing conditions as well as difficulty in the environment uh, in which we're working in. And so that's an important part of understanding complexity uh, and addressing complexity in, in a health system. There are also lessons we should learn recently about the Ebola outbreak. And I know there's lots of talk about you know, what is resilience in a resilient health system. But I think the first lesson is really that, you know, that we need to learn from the past, and I think we've failed to do so adequately in the Ebola outbreak. Uh, for example, the DR Congo had plenty of experience in handling, uh, in, in handling Ebola, and what we should have learned from them is that it's not just about having a quick response, which is critical, but it's about engaging communities early on in order to gain that trust and to provide them integrated clinical, lab, and surveillance, and, and, and hygiene, or particularly around burials. So that kind of approach really wasn't picked up until rather late in the epidemic, and rather a focus on building beds and, and, and international response that came rather late. But it is also important in terms of you know, understanding resilience in a health system. Well, where did it come from? Well, 
the res most of the resilience in a system comes from people, from people in, this, in the communities as well as, as families, but also on the providers and the local leadership. And that was critical to changing and stopping the outbreak. You know, behavior change and hygiene probably contributed more to stopping Ebola than ET, the building the beds uh, and the international response. So what we should have learned and is important for building resilience and strong health systems is about, you know, importance of engaging communities to build trust, about integrating community-based public health, clinical care, and, and hygiene, about using data routinely and sharing it widely, about engaging actors both at the center and at the periphery and, and supporting communication, and really depending on local and national leadership. So, you know, if I were to give a set of lessons that I think DFID should pay attention to in particular in strengthening health systems in low and middle income countries, I would start off with, you know, the importance of listening to the voice of the disadvantaged, to identify levels and causes and types of inequalities, and then bring to bear the best evidence. Partly it's, you know, what is the best evidence informed public health about what can work, but also the evidence around implementation, around how things can work. It's also important to apply a systems lens to look across the health systems, both for resorts that, resources that you can, can bring to bear, but also the effects intended and unintended. About being able to customize intervention to local capabilities and constraints, about adaptation, experimentation, again, focusing on implementation for sustainable change, a part of which is about governance and institution building. And finally, you know, integral to any kind of program is the need to measure, disclose results, and learn. And this is, again, especially important if you want to see how the poor can best benefit from health system strengthening efforts. Thank you very much.